Welcome to Asia Society, Hong Kong Center. It's great to see so many of you here on a, a Friday night. Um, there, I know there's a lot of exhibition opening, a lot of stuff happening in Hong Kong, and you guys are um, uh, photography enthusiasts. So it's so great to see um, so many of you here tonight for this uh, wonderful um, discussion uh, between our guest curator, uh, Ian Wheaties, and uh, and our um, uh really uh, somebody who really needs no introduction, uh, Steve McCurry. And we're delighted that we're able to bring you this exhibition, um, uh, double Picture in Asia, Double Take, uh, photo Photography of Brian Brake and Steve McCurry. Um, just give you a little bit of background on how this exhibition got started. Um, Jonathan, are you here? Jonathan Floss? Jonathan, thank you. Jonathan is uh, really the brainchild uh, behind this exhibition. Uh, Jonathan is a lawyer, so we'll forgive him for that. Uh, but Jonathan came to us uh, uh, when shortly after we opened. I think it was one of the first Art Basel Hong Kong um, about, about three, year, three or four years ago, three years ago, I, I believe, and came up with a really great idea. He's, uh, he's from New Zealand, and so he knows Brian's work very well, and he collects, uh, um, he's a collector of Brian's work, and came up with this idea uh, for us. And at the time, to be honest with you, I did not know who Brian Briggs was. I, I'm not. Uh, but it, since then, I've gotten to seeing Brian's work at some of the Art Basel uh, Hong Kong. And I, I remember one of the Art Basel Hong Kong seeing some of Brian's work of Hong Kong. Those of you uh, may not know Brian Break, uh, he passed away in 1988, but lived for many years uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and, and he took some, uh, in fact, one of the, books. I think he published some wonderful photography of Hong Kong, I believe, in the 70s and 80s. So from then on, I became really interested in Brian's work. And of course, Steve, um, those of you who know Afghan Girl, uh, knows that, that, that he is a photographer, a magnum photographer that has uh, photographed in some really difficult places, some wonderful uh, photographs uh, like Afghan Girl. But when Steve came to visit us about uh, two years ago, uh, maybe two and a half years ago, mentioned that um, he, Brian was somebody that, um, when he was 12 years old, um, saw Life Magazine, the Monsoon series uh, that Brian Brakes uh, did for Life Magazine, and inspired him to become um, a photographer, a uh, photojournalist. And so if you look at uh, their work, and I think some of you have seen the exhibition, if not, I encourage you uh, to come back and, and spend as much time as you can. We, the exhibition will be on until January. And I think the inspiration, uh, Brian's work uh, uh, for Steve. And then, and I was telling last night at our exhibition opening, growing up, um, I remember reading National Geographic and I remember seeing Afghan Girl and really being inspired by Steve's work and wanting to see more of Asia. So now that I'm here living in Hong Kong, have been working in Hong Kong, and I've been taking advantage of, of, of Hong Kong's wonderful location to see uh, Asia. Some of those photographs, that, in fact, a lot of the, the photographs that you see up on our um, Chantel Miller site, we, we could all take photographs like these these days with our smartphones, but we don't. I mean, there is a humanity in the work that Steve and Brian has done that really capture uh, the essence of Asia. And we also wanted to bring this exhibition here this year because 60th anniversary of Asia Society. Asia Society was founded in 1956 by John D. Rockefeller III. And one of the photographs up in the Chantel Miller Gallery that I particularly like was China, a color photograph of China taken in 1957 and a year after Asia Society was founded. And so look at these images and look at how China has changed or, or Asia has changed in these last uh, um, uh, five or six decades. And so, so I hope you all enjoy the exhibition. And I, without further ado, I want to bring both um, uh, the speaker up. Ian, Ian is, uh, Ian Weedy, we're really grateful for Ian to say yes to being guest, guest curator. Ian is retired. Ian has worked uh, as a museum uh, of New Zealand, Te Papa in, in New Zealand. And we can kind of enticed him to curate uh, the show. And thank you, Ian, for saying yes to be a guest curator. And and thanks, Steve, for being here uh, and part of the, you know, he's now part of the Asia Society uh, Hong Kong family. And I want to thank both of them for, for saying yes. And thank to Jonathan for giving this great idea. And enjoy the show. If you like it, please tell your friends. And I know 
Um, we are charging uh, for uh, this exhibition uh, $30, but if you know community group and you know uh, Hong Kong youth, uh, we will have tickets to give away. So just talk to our staff. We would love to have as many people see this wonderful exhibition uh, before it closes in January uh, because we are part of the community and I think as many people to see this exhibition as possible. Um, this exhibition, I think, remind us to look outward uh, where Hong Kong is part of Asia and that's why we're Asia Society and it's really important for us to remember our role uh, and rather than looking inward, there's too many uh, places now we're looking inward, but I think we might, all of you are here uh, because you're, you're, you're part of Asia Society, Hong Kong families. So without further ado, I want to invite uh, our wonderful speakers up tonight uh, and to give us uh, tonight's uh, dialogue. Steve and Ian? Yes, indeed. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I have a script. Um, Steve and I had a conversation on the phone. I have no idea where he was. He's always somewhere uh, else. Uh, he may have been in Kabul, he may have been in the Philippines. I uh, can't remember, Steve. But before we go on with this, there's um, something I would very much like to do because, um, as Alice has hinted, uh, an exhibition like this doesn't happen without a lot of people who very quickly become invisible. Steve and I are sitting up here because we are, in a sense, or Steve in particular, one of the principles of a project like this, um, but there are a lot of people that have been working on this project for three years, nearly. And I would like to mention a few of them in particular. Jonathan already. Without Jonathan Flores, um, I wouldn't have got the call. So thank you, Jonathan. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be engaged in this project. But I'd also very much like to acknowledge the people I've been working with over this time here at Asia Society Hong Kong, who are an extraordinarily uh, generous and professional and lovely group of people. Um, Dominic Chan, known to all of us who work with him as Dom, which it almost has a slightly mafia tone to it. But, um, I mean, he is the least Don or Dom-like person you could imagine. He's a very gentle but very uh, caring and really extraordinarily responsive person to have worked with. And I don't imagine that his task is easy um, in a situation like this, but he's managed it with great equanimity and calm and kindness. So thank you so much, Dom. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, and then there are two other very special people, um, the two assistant curators here at uh, Asia Society Hong Kong, Ashley Wu and Christy Su, wonderful young women who I have no doubt have astonishing futures ahead of them. And I, I think if you are here, Ashley and Christy, I would love you to stand up and be identified. There they are. <laughs> See? These people, these, these two, and the other people who worked on the show, the people who did the art handling, the people who were the lighting installers, the conservators who, um, did, the, who did the condition reporting, etc. these are the people who disappear once an exhibition is up. But they are the people without whom no exhibition will ever happen. And so I would like really to thank them from the bottom of my heart for making this such a pleasure to do. Right, yeah. so now. Uh, now to our script, Steve. Yeah. It's a very short document. Um, the exhibition, as you will have seen if you've been there, and as you will find out when you get there, is divided very simply into uh, a, a left-hand wall and a right-hand wall. The left-hand wall in each of the four chambers contains work by Brian Brake. The right-hand wall in each of the four chambers contains work by Steve. The idea is to set up a conversation. Um, each of the four chambers uh, is located, uh, is organized around a particular moment or theme. <clears throat> and so, um, as Alice pointed out, 
um, the monsoon subject and some of the monsoon locations, in particular India, were where, in a sense, Brian and Steve met um, around that opportunity, around that extraordinary phenomenon, which, of course, you're over the last few days quite familiar with here in Hong Kong. Um, and so the first chamber uh, is devoted to the work of these two photographers on and around the monsoon. And then we'll talk about what happens after that in a moment. But Steve, I wonder if you could, if you could begin by mm -hmm. talking to us a little bit about the monsoon moment in your life, mm -hmm. if you like. Sure. Start anywhere. Yeah. Um, well, I, I used to go to my grandmother's uh, every summer and in the basement she had this large stack of Life magazines. Uh, and I used to kind of pour over them just because they had great pictures from all sorts of places in the world. And one of the, uh, the essays that really kind of intrigued me was the great uh, essay by Brian Brake on the monsoon in India. I guess he shot it in 1960. And I, I saw it in the year, you know, 61 or whatever. And um, I was just so captivated by uh, this event and the drama of the rain and uh, how, how people looked. And I, I thought, you know, this, it was such a magical uh, set of pictures that I, I just dreamed about uh, going to that place someday and witnessing this incredible weather phenomenon. So, um, you know, I kind of filed that away in the back of my mind. Um, like 20 years later, I was in India and uh, for two years. I went there as a young freelance photographer um, and I stayed. I didn't have any money, so I just stayed there for two years uh, and uh, lived through two monsoons. Uh, and, you know, having seen Brian's work and seeing the drama of the monsoon, because, you know, if it rains too much, there's floods. And if it doesn't rain enough, <clears throat> uh, there's a potential for drought. And um, you have this enormous heat buildup in, in, you know, May and June. And uh, it's, it's like unbearable. You can't, you know, you just can't, you know, li you know, just can't survive and then the rain comes and everybody's relieved and they're you know it's, it's, it's go outside and there's a wonderful feeling of the rain hitting your face so um uh, uh, i thought you know i'm looking for an essay looking for a picture story uh you know th this is a great idea it hasn't been well it hasn't been redone in 20 years uh you know, I want to do it. I want to reinvent. I want to do it my own way. And so I, uh, that's what I set off to do. Um, the thing about, about the, the monsoon is, especially when it floods, which is really one of the more dramatic times to, to photograph, because people have to live their lives often in waste deep water, going from their home to market or to their work. And um, so I started trying to shoot kind of on the curb, you know, and shoot like this. You know. And then I, I, there was a shot over there. I thought, I can't get there, so let me get in a boat. So I, I'd hire a boat, and I'd kind of balance in the boat. But I still couldn't. The boat wouldn't move that quickly. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to get some uh, fishing waders, you know, boots to come up to here. And uh, so I got those, and I was walking through the, through the streets of like Varanasi or Poor Bunder. And uh, what happened was the water would get inside those boots and it was kind of awful, this slushy kind of. <laughs> so I thought, okay, you know what? I got myself into this mess and this horrible project, but I'm going to have to just get into the water with everybody else, you know, this dirty nasty you can't imagine you can't imagine what's floating in that in that water and it's all there and i thought you know what i'm just gonna i just gotta get in let the chips fall where they may if i get 
if I die, then so be it. <laughs> I, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to fail. I'm going to just, whatever it takes, going to jump in. So I, I spent days in the, in the water. Uh, you come back to the hotel at night and, and your you know, feet were all wrinkled and, you know, and I put disinfectant on it. And uh, I just, I just, uh, I figured I'm going to, if it kills me, I'm going to do this damn thing. <laughs> so that's, that's what I, I, I ended up doing. All right. There was a, um, an interesting aspect of break story with the monsoon. And I wonder if, you know, it's something that you had an experience of as well. When break took his first set of photographs of the monsoon in 1960, he showed it to a number of his friends and colleagues who were Indian, in India, writers and other photographers. And they said, this isn't our monsoon. This is not how it is for us. Um, you've made it to your monsoon. It's too much your monsoon. And, and, and Brake said, so what did I do wrong here? And the first thing they said was, you have to go out into the countryside because it's about rain in the land that will produce food. That's a major component of it. But it's also, it's a very dark time. And when the weather is overcast and when the storms are coming through and when it's raining day after day after day, you never see the sun. You know, it's a time that is, um, of course, useful because there's irrigation happening. But it's also a time when the mood of the country may be quite down. Um, but they said, you have to photograph that monsoon. And so he took a complete new set of photographs, um, of which there are two or three of those very, very dark images in the exhibition. And when it came time for him to present those for publication, because he was, of course, having to make a living out of this work, <clears throat> he, he showed them, first of all, to Life magazine, and they turned them down initially. They said, this is ridiculous. You know, th we can't publish photographs like this. They're nearly completely dark. You can't see anything happening. But then they thought about it and they looked at them and eventually they were published, as you know, and this was the essay that you saw. And to some extent, they were, um, they were a paradigm shift. They, they changed something, which was pretty hard to do in Life magazine. Um, now, did you have any kind of similar experience when you were photographing uh, let's start with the monsoon, where the people you were engaged with, the people who were helping you through the place, or the people who were giving you advice or discussing your work with you, did they ever comment to you on what it was you were doing and whether you were getting their story? Well, I, 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 I wanted to get into that dark corner and, and show the muck and the, and, uh, you know, the hardship and the, you know, the, the, both sides. So I, I never uh, actually encountered that criticism. Although there, you know, when, when you, as a foreigner, you go to another country, there's also the idea that you're photographing it um, as a, as, as a foreigner, as, as a whatever, you know, whatever. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that's, I think that, you know, I go to India, I go to China. Uh, I know there's a lot of, um, foreign photographers go to, to, to my country and photograph. So I think it's just, you know, one person's mm. view and one person's, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's nothing more. Yeah. I mean, I think when we photographed, it was just our impression of uh, our sort of poem to, to this incredible dramatic uh, weather event, yeah. you know, and uh, it, it's not supposed to, be the be all and end all. I'm sure there'll be other. I'm sure there's wonderful Indian photographers that uh, will reinvent the story and do it in their own way, maybe better yeah. or different. So God bless. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that that kind of dialogue that gets set up between attempting, as Brake did, successfully or not. I mean, the uh, the jury's out. We will probably never know. Um, this attempting to be inside the mentality of a local experience and having simply your own experience as a photographer, there's always going to be 
a stretch between those two, isn't there? Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder how that kind of um, that kind of wrestling between the experience of the place as it's lived by the people who are there and the way in which you represent it as someone just coming in with your own fresh eyes. Um, I wonder how that's played out in other parts of Asia. For example, I mean, Afghanistan, perhaps, where you kind of broke through initially in 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that work? Because you were traveling with Mujahideen. Right. You were kind of undercover. It was not... I imagine a particularly easy or comfortable situation mm -hmm. to be in. Um, well, they, uh, I was there as just as a tourist in Pakistan, just wandering around trying to get out of the heat just prior to the monsoon. And uh, I was in a hotel and uh, there were a couple Afghan men in the next room. And over the course of several days, we started talking and they were explaining that this you know, their villages were being destroyed and that the government was bombing them and all this. And uh, they said, you know, nobody knows about this, uh, what's happening. And you know, you're a photographer. Uh, why don't we take you in so you can show the world what's what's happening to our villages? So I thought that that, that sounds like a real adventure. <laughs> Let me. But then as I started thinking more deeply about it, I thought that that's probably not a good idea because I didn't know who they were. I didn't know where we were going. They wanted me to cross this international frontier with, without a passport, and there was no communication. There was no medical facilities. There were no roads. Uh, and I started thinking, maybe I'll just say thanks, but no thanks. But then I just, <laughs> I, I eventually I thought, you know what, hell, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. And uh, again, just, uh, you have to take risks, especially when you're, uh, a young freelance photographer. You need to uh, just, you know, go for it. So that's what I did. And um, I came out with pictures that um, uh, didn't really get published except for a couple, but it was that was encouraging. Uh, a couple in the New York Times. And uh, the story went cold for a few months. I went back again for like a month. And just, the, the, you know, Three months later, the Russians invaded, uh, the Soviet Union invaded, and uh, it became this incredible international story um, and had all, had all these pictures. Nobody else primarily had any pictures. And so I um, was able to get published in all these major magazines. And so I went, <coughs> suddenly I went from this sort of uh, unknown photographer to this sort of... <laughs> you know, Afghan expert. Which the go-to guy. Yeah, the, the, which I was, I was a, a, some, <laughs> but it, you know, that was my, my break. Um, and I uh, went back over and over again. And because of those two years in India, traveling the trains, living the monsoon, I started kind of mining all that wealth of experience. And I went to the different magazines and said, you know, let's do a story on this or let's do a story on that. And uh, based on the fact that I had all this been published and I got the songs from Time Magazine and uh, Newsweek, uh, I started, the ball started to roll. And uh, that was really the, so the, the kind of my first uh, go-to stories was the monsoon mm -hmm. and this train journey across the subcontinent I did with Paul Theroux. And... Um, and then, you know, once I be, you know, spending, you know, several years in India, they, I just became this sort of um, people give you assignments based on what they think you can do. So I ended up going back over and over again. And, you know, the years go by and pretty soon, uh, you know, here we are, yeah. like 80 trips to, to India. <laughs> right. But can we wind it back just a little? Because, um, I mean, that, that, that was a, uh, it wasn't just a stroke of good fortune. It was the fact that you went there. If you hadn't gone there, you wouldn't have made your own opportunity. And I think, you know, let, let's remind ourselves that photographs involve something that you could call opportunity time. You know, you have to go there and you have to be there and you have to take the chance. And I think one of the wonderful characteristics of Steve's work is that he's, he does that. He goes to places and he takes his chance and you can feel opportunity time um, in the photographs. 
Um, I, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about the kind of first, perhaps the f first or the nearly first stage of the breakthrough that happened um, with National Geographic in particular, wasn't it? Because this was, um, <clears throat> this was quite early days in the development of the way in which that magazine was producing really substantial texts. I mean, Paul Theroux being one good example. Um, it was a different model, especially a different model from Life magazine, you right. know, which had an extremely biased editorial policy, um, used very minimal copywriters in-house for the most part. Monsoon was an exception. Um, uh, how was your experience then with Nat Geo, which took you on really around 84? Yeah. Well, by that time, I think Life Magazine was gone. Yeah, it was. I think it was gone. And, um, uh, you know, I, I had, a, you know, I, I decided that, um, you know, I needed work and that seemed like the best uh, after my Afghanistan success. Uh, I, I got a call from National Geographic from uh, Bill Garrett, who was um, oh, yeah. the editor. He just passed away, unfortunately, a few weeks ago. But um, uh, he, he uh, there was this idea that there was Soviet Union going to Afghanistan, and there may be a move into Baluchistan, which is right below Afghanistan, between that and the Persian Gulf. And they, you know, he asked me, "Can can you have do you have contacts?" in this part of Pakistan. And I said, oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Uh, and so I, I went off to, <clears throat> to do this story in, in Baluchistan because it was that, this is my big break to, to go to get an assignment. And when I got to Quetta in Baluchistan, they said, oh, no, no, you, th this, uh, this, this province is like off limits to foreigners. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, I've just blown my, my chance. Uh, so I just plowed through. Again, I just decided, you know, hell with it. I'm going to just go for it. I got arrested, put in jail. Uh, I thought my, I was going to send out, be sent out of the country, uh, but they let me go and I continued to work. So that three-month assignment uh, turned into a seven-month assignment. And in the end, after the seven months of hard work, I mean, I just, you know, sleeping on, you know, out on the ground like a dog, uh, really harsh conditions. Uh, they never published the story. <laughs> it just ended up uh, getting getting cut. But um, but they saw my enthusiasm and I, <laughs> they gave me other work. And then I got into the, you know, right. into, back to India. Let's talk a little bit about the Magnum Collective. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure how many people in this audience, I was going to say how many people in this audience do know about the Magnum Collective, but it might be more appropriate to say how many people in this audience don't know about the Magnum Collective. It, you know, it became extraordinarily famous. Um, it still is in its own way. It's changed over time. But as a, as a photographer's collective that managed and sold the portfolios of work by some of the most extraordinary photographers in the 20th century, um, Robert Carper, Cartier Bresson, and on and on. Um, uh, you joined Magnum, you were yeah, invited to join yeah. Magnum in? Uh, 1986. 86, right. Right. I, was, I had known uh, Bruno Barbie. Uh, Eve Arnold, uh, Rene Burry. Eve Arnold. Yeah, uh, yeah um, um, and uh, they encouraged me to to submit my portfolio. Of all the photographic agency, of all the photographic agencies that ever existed, the one, the greatest agency was Magnum, and most other agencies have have, have gone away, but Magnum survives. And g growing up. Um, and becoming a photographer, you know, at 19 and uh, studying it when I was in college. I, I would pour over the books of Robert Kapp and Henri Cartier-Bresson and Eugene Smith, who was a member for a while. 
um, Warner Bischoff. Mm. And uh, I just, uh, you know, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to travel the world. Uh, and be a Magnum photographer. And be a Magnum photographer. That yeah. was my ambition. And um, somehow I managed to pull that off. <laughs> I don't know. Right. But uh, uh, I used to go over to um, Henri's apartment and with his wife, Martine. And uh, when I get a book, I come over and show it to him. And it was always uh, kind of a risk because he could be really tough. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say he would be cruel, but he could be tough. Uh, and, and uh, I, you know, kind of wait and see his reaction. But I generally was positive. <laughs> right. It's interesting with Cartier-Bresson. I mean, the myth, and it, I'm, like most myths, it probably has some foundation in truth, that there was a certain skeptical attitude or a, a slightly puritanical attitude towards the use of color at Magnum. Certainly early on, of course, no longer. That would be ridiculous. Um, but in fact, Cartier-Bresson himself, very early on in his, some of his first work in China, he tried some color and it was used in Life magazine. But then he gave it away and he returned largely, I think, to working in black and white. And <clears throat> the story goes that it was because working in color made him feel anxious. He felt as though he didn't have a kind of proper control or something. Did he ever talk to you about that? Well, we, 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 he used to come into the agency and if he found a color slide, he'd get a pair of scissors and cut it up. <laughs> uh, that may be why Brake canned out because yeah. Brake gave up Magnum after a while. Right. Um, but I think I, it may have been because their, their cut was 40% plus and he wanted to do better than that. Yeah, you're heavily taxed. Yeah. That's, a whole, that's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, uh, for the first hundred years of photography, color just wasn't that great. I mean, maybe you could say, well, some, there was some good color work, or it was, well, there was two problems, shooting the picture and then having it printed yeah. in, in a book or a magazine, and you know, they didn't look that great. It was mostly I mean, awful. Yeah, maybe, uh, you know, maybe there was an occasional good color reproduction in the 50s or the 60s, but I think it was deep in, you know, I think it's only in the last maybe 30 years yeah. that it's really kind of, you know, taken off. So, um, you know, because of that, uh, all the great photographers, Andre Cortez and uh, Henri and, and uh, all the, you know, Dorothea Lang, everybody was uh, was uh, shooting uh, black and white. But in fact, um, and people always ask, you know, ask me about black and white color. But the, the fact is that the world is in color. So it makes more sense to photograph the world, you know, as it is rather than, and, and a place like China, India, uh, so much of the story of a place is the color. I mean, you go into a, a temple here, a temple there, red or orange or whatever, and that's part of the culture. So if you photograph that in black and white, it comes out great. Well, that's not telling that's not the way it is yeah so um anyway I, I think the whole question of black and white or color is at this point is i think the one should photograph however one wants to you know it's all good yeah uh, there was a there was a kind of almost um a comparable reaction in the entrenched photographic community, the purest oh, right. photographic community, when digital photography came along. Mm -hmm. And people saying, no, 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 you can't, this can never be really good photography. I mean, I'm sorry, too late now. Um, they were wrong. Um, Break photographed China in color in 57 and 59, um, and of course the monsoon. They were not the earliest of color portfolios, but they were pretty early. They were. And they were, in Life magazine, they were mixed up with some significant amounts of black and white photography as well, some of it of, by, by break. When do you think the tide actually shifted towards what we would now regard as being the kind of standard of photography, the standards by which photography is said to tell stories 
um, in a way that isn't predicated on a kind of rather puritanical, reductivist model of photography? Well, I don't know. There, there were great essays. Uh, uh, I think the best essays probably, in fact, were maybe more in Life magazine mm. because Life was, uh, you know, covering, you know, World War II and Korea mm. in a much more sort of realistic way. Um, and they were doing Hollywood and show business and National Geographic never went into those areas. No. And uh, life throws a party. There's yeah. always that section in Life magazine, a, one or another of the brilliant parties that they sent their staff along to. Right, exactly, yeah. 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 So uh, I always uh, thought that the, to work for Life, when they could send out a dozen photographers and they could all go off and spend months or even years an unlimited amount of expenses and, um, and there was never a guarantee your piece would be published because they had so much money that they could send out people all over the place and uh, so that seemed uh, like great fun to have an unlimited yeah. expense account hiring planes and helicopters and <laughs> yeah. going here. There was one instance where Brake was um, doing a, an assignment on ancient monuments in England. I think. And uh, he wanted to get some aerial photographs of Hadrian's Wall. And it was raining and cloudy and wasn't any good. And he didn't get one shot. There was one shot he wanted and he'd spent squillions already on helicopters and God knows what. And then there was a little break in the weather. <laughs> so he wired his office at Life and said, a helicopter? Okay. And they went, yeah. So up he went in his helicopter. He took one, two, three, four, five shots, the weather shut down, he went back. There is Hadrian's Wall in Life magazine oh, really? oh, at man. somewhat extraordinary, exaggerated, excessive expense, one would have to say. Like, but it must have been a bit of a life while it lasted. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Those days are gone, man. I know. <laughs> you know, I remember we started, we were flying first class. Everywhere was first class. And then uh, there was an announcement, oh, we're going to suddenly it's gonna have to go business class. Oh, Whoops. my God. You think the sky was falling. Somebody raised their hand and said, if you want a first class magazine, we got to go first class, you know. <laughs> so, but curators fly yeah. budget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then they came back some years later and said, OK, the, if you want to go business class, you're going to have to use your own points, your own uh, miles, frequent uh, flyer miles. So, so you're going to New Zealand? <laughs> coach. <laughs> the furthest person on the planet is coach. Yeah. Worth the, with the trouble. And then suddenly photographers are getting bad knees and say, I can't travel that far. All right. <laughs> got to go to business class. Um, I wonder if we're, we're, we've still got plenty of time, but I wonder if before we ask for questions, Alice is going to start waving at us at some point, oh. but not yet. Um, because I would love to ask Steve, you know, in the context of this exhibition, which I do hope you'll go to, and also other uh, catalogues down there. Have, have the organizers um, got a big pile of like 400 catalogues down the back of the hall? Anyone know? Because if they have, Steve might like to sign some and you might like to buy them, 400 of them. That would be great. Just to thinking about it, just thinking about it. Um, but meanwhile, um, I mean, because the exhibition is organized uh, as a result of Jonathan's brainwave as a conversation between you and, and um, Brian, um, I mean, are there any kind of points of comparison between your approaches and the ways in which you make pictures? With Brian? With Brian yeah. that, that come to mind? Well, I think Brian had a really wonderful sense of color I think uh, it, compositionally, uh, I think he had a great eye and, um, you know, his, I think his portraiture, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, the Kurosawa picture and others, I think are just really well crafted. Um, you know, this is Aung San Suu Kyi from Burma. Sometimes uh, you walk in 
to uh, photograph s somebody and they say, okay, well, you know, we give you half an hour. What do you, how do, what do you want to do? And then you have to craft a picture. Um, and that involves uh, thought and planning and all of that. So I think he had a good, uh, uh, he was able to pre-visualize. Uh, there's a wonderful picture of this actress and this, uh, she's beautifully lit, beautifully composed with, um, uh, you know, kind of a Hollywood executive in the background, but here in Hong Kong. Yeah. Right? So, um, but it, it's a nice uh, juxtaposition. And, um, but this is something which he uh, had to imagine and something he had to pre-visualize. So I think that that's a, you know, that's a talent. I think you have to, if you're confronted with a, and, and portraiture is always important and whatever you do in, in photography. And I think he had a great uh, eye, a great imagination mm. for coming up with the right solution to some of the, these portrait situations. Yeah. I think, too, um, I noticed that, you know, your work, the work that is, whether or not it's had to be organized or whether it was just exactly the right moment and you got it at the moment when it was there for you, you took the chance. But you have a um, an ability to find a, a sense of stillness in the image. You know, there's a sense that the the photograph has snatched that moment out of time, and stopped it. And it's it's a kind of a quiet moment. Um, not always, of course. I mean, there are moments in your work where it ain't quiet. It's um, you know there is even frenetic activity going mm -hmm. on, but. It seems to me that often in Brian's work, there's a sense that um, there's a, cine a, a cinematic effect. Half the pictures already left the frame. It's as though he's captured not um, a moment stopped in time, but a moment of time passing. So the parched workers, for example, standing at the entrance to that monsoon section, one of the men in that, we assume it's a man in the photograph, of three figures, three men, desperately hot, sheltering under a tree, unable to move. And all you can see of one of them is his elbow. Mm -hmm. And of course, the men are utterly still because they're so damned hot, they can't move an inch. But it's as though the camera has found a cinematic way of showing that by panning across them. All photographs are still photographs. I mean, obviously. But it's as though that's a film still. Mm -hmm. And it often struck me that that is one of the interesting points of comparison between your, Brian, your work and, and Brian's work. Well, you know, that picture you described, which is, you know, that crazy hot period just before the onset of the monsoon. Uh, I, I, there was a couple. There was another picture of a man on a, on a cot in, yeah. in the sun. They called it a charpoy. And... Um, I thought they were really, uh, you know, poetic pictures. And I thought, you know, when, I, when I do my take on the monsoon, I want to I want to start in the same way. So my picture of the women in the dust storm was sort mm. of, uh, again, uh, inspired by Brian, because, I mean, you can go and just do the rain. But that whole sort of heat, dry wind is is really the the prelude. It's really the buildup which is dramatic because, wow, it's like sometimes it's so hot that you can't breathe. Mm. And so I thought that's how I want to start. And so when I was riding through the desert of uh, Rajasthan and I saw those women, I thought, well, my first inclination was to roll the window up and to, and to kind of weather the storm because it was all that dust. I thought I'm going to break, I'll, I'll just spoil my camera, but I thought, wait a minute, I'm, I'm supposed, to be, <laughs> supposed to be working, <laughs> so I better get out and take some pictures. So I'm desperately looking for something to shoot because those dust storms don't last so long. And um, I saw them off on the field, and I jumped out and ran across and, and, and made a, I don't know, a shot, maybe a, a roll of film right. on that one s s series, that one scene. But uh, the, the lens I had on my camera, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure it was a 35 millimeter lens and I didn't want to change the lens because of the the dust so there's a bit of distortion 
as I was looking straight, the, the lens uh, made these these sort of pottery, this pottery look, it, it looks like you're looking down. Uh, it's a different perspective, but in fact, it's just the, the wide angle. Right, well, that's so interesting because we were doing a, um, a training session with some of the docents who will be showing people th um, through the exhibition. And uh, one of the women who was on that tour came up afterwards and asked me a question that I could not answer because I don't have any of that technical knowledge. And she'd noticed that the, that the perspective in that photograph of those women sheltering with the two pots that appear obviously to be empty of water, which is like a piece of poetry in that mm. image. Um, and she said, how did that happen? It looks as though it's been shot from above. The thing is kind of collapsed and that it's tilted and you can see, and I, I have no idea. Yeah. So it was a wide angle lens. Yeah, I shot another picture in Kashmir, of this light streaming into a mosque. I shot with a 24 millimeter lens. Um, and because there were two streams of light coming through and because of the wide angle, the beams, you think they would be parallel, but because of the wide angle, they're not parallel. The one's veering off in a different direction. And somebody um, wrote into the magazine and said, uh, you, know, uh, you know, was the picture lit? <laughs> I mean, was the, were there strobes lighting it and from different directions, but it was just the wide angle lens. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. That would be too much work. <laughs> No, I, I, we've got 10 minutes. Should we yes. ask some questions? I think, ask for uh, some questions? Yes. We are going to open up for a Q&A from that the would be audience. Lovely, yeah. And I know people have plans. We want to end as uh, much on time as possible. We have a question over there. Steve, hi. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in this room in saying that I'm an amazing, I'm a great fan of yours and of all the photographers I've come across. It's probably your work that I find the most moving and the most powerful. Um, as a travel photographer, I wanted to ask you one of the most striking things about your photos, particularly the, the portraits, is the way that people seem to almost engage with the camera. You know, there's a very direct gaze from a lot of the subjects, and there's a, a lot of emotion in that. How, what's your approach to sort of engaging with the subjects? Do you, try, do you try and engage with them, or do you try not to engage and always be part of the background? How do you do that when you're in so many different cultures, don't speak the language, and so on? Well, I try and uh, relax people. I try and, with a bit of humor, often direct it back at myself to get people to diffuse the, the kind of the awkward uh, and self-conscious. Because if you stop somebody on the street, they generally um, are kind of, it's kind of, you know, they're, they're a little bit put off. By, so I... Um, you know, I try and slow the thing down. I try and make it very... Because first their inclination is to laugh or smile or giggle or be kind of... And I want to I get past that to um, something which is more natural and more just them without the mask. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's just whatever that chemistry is, that, uh, chem you know, whatever uh, connection we have... Um, I think part of it is, um, I, I think they look at me and think uh, this kind of, I'm fumbling with my equipment and they probably just take, they probably take pity on me. And that expression you see is I'm thinking, this guy doesn't know, I have a clue what he's doing, but, and, and such a bad photographer, I'm going to, they're kind of amused and kind of, it's kind of a sad expression that they're just trying to help me out, maybe. Maybe that's what it is, they're just trying to help me. <laughs> um, but I think that, um, if you can, um, you know, the other thing is that as a foreigner, you've got this expensive camera and you got to break that, you know, there's the kind of them and us. And I'm, when I'm doing a workshop, uh, I see photographers standing way off with a telephoto. They don't want to kind of jump in and talk to people. I mean, it, you know, life isn't just about photography. If you're in a place... You know, before you start clicking pictures, you have to, you know, engage people and talk to people, joke with people, so that you become part of the, the scene. And once you're in the, you know, that, then you can start to work and, 
you don't feel like you're this outsider. You feel like you're part of the, and, and then you feel like people, um, you feel that you're accepted and, uh, but uh, there is the, something, uh, yeah, I think you just have to uh, treat people with respect and dignity. And um, if people don't want to be photographed, I, you always have to ask permission unless they're sleeping on a park bench or something. Uh, uh, that's a joke. Because <laughs> I have a whole series of people sleeping all over the world. <laughs> but um, I think it's just a, just a <clears throat> trying to be, have, get a genuine uh, picture of people as they are without any kind of, you know, mask. Okay, any other question? There is one, one down there. Okay. Hi, Steve. Uh, nice to see you in Hong Kong. I have some questions for you. And the first one is, um, we all know that uh, Magnum photographers produce high quality images. But nowadays, uh, many uh, international wires, different agencies and media will battle against the time, the quantity and efficiency. Uh, so um, does that bring any challenges to Magnum or yourself? So, and then the second question is that, uh, I know you recently are interested in uh, Buddhism. So does Buddhism uh, bring some uh, changes on your thoughts and ideas on photography and how was it? And, um, and the third question is that, um, <laughs> sorry. The third can, I, question can I answer is the first two, please? Uh, <laughs> and then we'll get, I, I think that uh, for me, uh, I've always, right from the first time I went to India, uh, I was attracted to, uh, to, to Buddhism and the, 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 there was something about it which um, I found very soothing, very peaceful. Uh, I love the idea of compassion and, and trying to improve oneself. Uh, and I found myself going to Nepal, going to Bhutan, going to Sikkim, going to you know, Burma, going to Tibet. And I just, uh, these were areas that I, I just felt really comfortable with and wanted to do a lifelong project on Buddhism and hopefully uh, working on a book. And uh, so th this, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a practicing Buddhist, although I feel that so many of the principles of Buddhism we can all apply to our lives. We don't, have, we don't have to be Buddhist, but we can learn so much from it. Um, as far as, um, you, know, the, the, you know, back when we all started, uh, you know, there were, uh, the, the world's changed and so many of the Magnum photographers, instead of, um, you know, the wire trying to get these, trying to compete with television and all this, uh, uh, a lot of uh, Magnum now is, you know, in the old days, everybody were, were, were running around the world photographing current events. Now I would say maybe half the photographers are doing sort of photography as art, they're doing their own projects, and they're not uh, globe trotting around the world doing, um, you know, chasing uh, wars or whatnot, um, because uh, virtually all that magazine photography is, is gone. I remember my first trip to Afghanistan um, once this, after the Soviets invaded. Uh, I showed up in Peshawar and there were seven, seven photographers on assignment for Time Magazine, just Time Magazine. So I was like the eighth. And there was, you know, then there were all the wires and the agencies, there's Sigma Gamma, Black Star, uh, other European magazines. And so, um, but that's, that's, that, those days are long gone. And so many photographers now have to, you know, go there on their own expense. And uh, the whole thing, and because you can, with, with, with digital photography now and with cell phones, uh, it's instant. You know, somebody can photograph something and it's out there in the world mm. in, the, in the next second. So the days of getting, going somewhere and getting an exclusive are greatly diminished. Yeah. So it's, it's very interesting, um, just to cut in. I mean, here in Hong Kong, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not telling you, obviously, anything you don't know extremely well and much better than me, but it was absolutely fascinating for someone not living here during the time of the umbrella events, the occupation, the enormous amount of photographic material that appeared online overnight and regularly through the day, an extraordinary 
amount of coverage. And of course, the same thing happened in Taksim Square and what have you. So it, it, it is partly that, isn't it? It's kind of citizen photography that has taken over where once upon a time the photojournalist was the one who had the job. So, yeah, it's mm. a whole new day. Okay. And can I have one more question? Sorry. Uh, really quick, because we're running out of time. I'll ask a question. <laughs> okay, so Steve. Let, let me uh, give somebody else a chance, please. Yes. Oh, thanks. Oh, so first of all, I would like to say thank you for your great, great work. My question is, you have traveled extensively around the world. Is there a country or a region where you're still wishing or dreaming or yearning to go? Well, I, I have an exhibition in Iran in, uh, in January, and I'm hoping uh, I can get a visa. I, I travel on an American passport, so that might be very difficult. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, my work from the region is, is you know, I, so they've agreed to do the exhibition. I just hope that I get a visa. So Iran, I'd like to go to Madagascar. I've never been to Mongolia. Uh, I'd like to do further work in sort of Russia and New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand, exactly. New Zealand's coming, yes. <laughs> Jonathan. Uh, and China. Uh, I, I was offered an assignment uh, with a, another assignment with Paul through to, to do um, uh, a train journey across China, 1986. And, and I've always regretted not accepting that assignment because I wanted to go to the Philippines and photograph that whole, uh, you know, Marcos and all that. Uh, but that would have been a great body of work to, to have been going by train through China in 1986. That would. But, you know, you know that, that's one of the great regrets of my career. Well, you should do it. There's one more question. Yeah. Um, a I'm big sorry. part of the uh, inspiration for your work is how unique and exotic it was, especially at the time. And not only have cameras become more ubiquitous, but travel has become much easier and the world's mm -hmm. become smaller. Do you feel like the frontier is shrinking? And if you do, do you lament that fact at all? Well, I lament the fact that the world's becoming kind of homogenous and globalized. And it's, you know, everything, the uh, way people dress, uh, which was so wonderful in certain parts of, of the world, uh, is now disappearing and architecture's uh, in certain places is kind of disappearing. Um, and um, I mean, there's always going to be great ways to see the world, great stories and great art that can be created. But, uh, you know, th there are parts of the world which unfortunately are, you know, I think of the American, you know, the Native Americans and what an amazing culture that was. And that's virtually gone. Uh, and, uh, you know, you go through Rajasthan now and, uh, you know, people are wearing baseball caps and blue jeans and, and it's OK. I mean, this is progress. It's totally unstoppable. Uh, and, it, it, you know, there's sort of good news, bad news. But um, it's a new it's a new, you know, you got to find new ways to explore the world yeah. with your camera, with your with your pen. There was just to add to that, there was a very interesting moment. Um, 1978, the American Airlines Deregulation Act, which made air uh, travel competitive and brought prices down. And it was shortly after that that National Geographic introduced its National Geo Traveller. And at that point, the word exotic became indispensable in copywriting for those magazines. It, it absolutely, it went ballistic. The whole idea of the exotic as a destination. And so the destination became something that the photograph then had to produce in a way. Uh, it, was, yeah. it was a very fast revolution, that one. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we really, uh, we're gonna have quest, uh, time for maybe one or two more um, over there. Uh, with your uh, regard to the last role of Kodachrome, uh, was there one shot that you kind of went out looking, trying to find for that last role that you did get and one that you didn't get? Well, just the, I, the, the, the best film ever made, in my view, was Kodachrome. And uh, when we found out that they were going to discontinue 
Kodachrome was going to disappear, and I had used Kodachrome for many years, uh, I, I asked Kodak if I could get the very last roll, and I wanted to do a project. So I got the roll, and I figured, now what the hell am I going to do? Uh, so I decided I'm going to photograph iconic places and iconic people. I want to go back to India uh, because so much of my career had been, you know, it was in India. So I, I but to answer your question, um, <coughs> living in New York, we, I want to photograph um, an iconic place and, and an iconic person. So I photographed the, the iconic place was uh, Grand Central Station. And the iconic person was Robert De Niro, who, uh, you know, I've always, uh, I mean, <laughs> I, so many of his, his films still, still ring around in my, in my, my brain. I, I think he was a, he's a brilliant uh, actor. And uh, so I met him, photographed him. In fact, the first uh, six exposures on the role are, are of him because I was worried he'd, he'd blink or something. So I was very, you know. Um, and then I went to India, and the next <coughs> highlight of the role was photographing the Rabari people. They're a semi-nomadic um, tribes, uh, herdsmen. And uh, that was great because their way of life is disappearing because of, you know, modernity and, and highways and fences and whatnot. Um, and uh, so I um, spent some time with them photographing portraits of Rabari people. And uh, the rest of the pictures are maybe not that great, <laughs> But it was great fun shooting them, you know, uh, and uh, and I, I don't lament. I mean, it was, I, it was great to pay homage to Kodachrome, but I don't lament the passing of, of of film. I mean, it was great, but now I think we're in a much better situation with digital, being able to photograph in extremely low light and photograph. Uh, in the old days, you know, when it got started to get dark, you'd have to get a tripod. Now you can kind of work through that. Um, okay. Um, I can think. Can I just say one more thing? I'd like to thank Asia Society and Alice for hosting me and the show. It's spectacular. Thank you very much. I want to thank. Jonathan, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> I want to, I think um, Ian already thanked my wonderful staff, I think especially the Cali team and the events team, as well as our wonderful uh, entire staff for making this exhibition possible. And also, I forgot to thank our lead sponsor. Uh, MedLife Foundation. Uh, they've been a wonderful supporter of Asia Society, so I want to thank them. And also, I uh, thank all of you. But uh, before I give the present um, to um, our two speakers, I also, I, I want to, I, just out of curiosity, all of a sudden, when you were talking about, um, uh, my, I want to save uh, the last question uh, for me. Are you on Instagram? Just out of curiosity? Me? You. Uh, yes. You are. Okay, so yeah. we can follow. Few, I'm, I'm trying to build it up. It's not quite where we want it, but it's it's close to uh, where we want to be. All right, good. <laughs> so so those of you who start following uh, Steve on Instagram, and also Dom took a wonderful photo um, the other day of Steve with the Afghan girl uh, stepping out of the our elevator on roof garden. It's, it's one of my favorites. So <laughs> that's going to be going on our Instagram. So Great. before I let you both off and before I give you a gift, you were talking about uh, panoramic shots. Uh, I picked up a gadget this summer uh, in Europe, and I figure you guys can all participate in this. Um, this little little gadget that I want to use, and I would like to have all of you be part of this photo, and the two of you. So we're going to do a do a, a, a shot for our uh, Asia Society Instagram uh, right, and good. Facebook. So so so, so, so so bear with me. Okay. Let's. Where do you want us? Have you seen this? Where do you want us to be? Uh, I think, around? well, I think we're going to do a, a big selfie, I guess. Um, oh, okay. And I need you to uh, be in part of it. And we're, not going to many... we're not going to step off backwards. No, no, no. no. I, think, I think being here would actually make the oh, shots sorry. even better. Let me pick out this first. Um, yes, this is great. Uh, and you've got the audience. I have. In fact, this is a fish eye. It magnifies it by, I think, almost four times. And a lot of you are in it. Where did so you get this? I got this in Paris. Oh. Uh, uh, but, but it's available now in many places. You have You're to be in it. You're cropped out, man. You gotta watch <laughs> so, uh, Hi. all right, so I'm going to try to get as many of us We in have it. to get our selfie faces on. All right, all right. We is... want 400 selfie faces, okay? All right. Ready? Okay. Uh, Ian, 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 look here. Everybody. All right. All right. 
Thank you. That's Beautiful. enough. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> Oh, thank Small you token of our appreciation. Thank, thank you, you, Ian. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. And come and uh, come and see the exhibition. Uh, and you know, the show is going to be here until January. And we're going to have some wonderful workshops and programs uh, coming up for as part of the exhibition. So check it out on our website. And this will also be on our on our Facebook and website as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.